So, yeah. Uh, thank you, my friend. So let me uh, let, let me start by uh, showing a small clip of a a video of a recent documentary that was put on Netflix by uh, I believe an Israeli uh, Old Testament scholar. Okay. Uh, because she does represent, or she does portray uh, the general understanding, the general idea uh, that is out there in regards towards the validity or not of the of King David. So let me let me see if this works. A 
I've seen them, the results can backfire and undermine those very claims. Religion speaks to the mysterious and unexplained part of us, whereas politics deals with the here and now. Perhaps they should remain apart for the sake of all the people of this land. Remain apart. Included an advanced state. It's pretty clear to me that an expansionist and mighty king like Omri could leave such an obvious trace in young Joshua on record. The King David, about whom the Bible makes even bigger claims, should also have left a clear, visible footprint. The visible extent of Omri's empire and the scant evidence for David's proves to me that we can't just take the Bible's account of David at face value. So is the story too exaggerated to be historically reliable? So, as you can see, that is the, um, the current mainstream of reading about King David. The story is exaggerated. The archaeological record does not add up to the claims that are made in the Bible. And uh, the resurgence of a nation called Israel uh, is limited to probably the 8th, 7th century and the result of perhaps a social revolution, a peace revolution of Canaanites that tried to use or set up a political agenda, political propaganda using uh, names like David or creating fiction characters named as David, Solomon, and also exalting the name of, uh, well, pronounced Yahweh, the name of God, and this deity that supposedly justified the emergence of the nation. Now, to the credit, you know, it's not the first time that, I mean, it's not unique to Israel, it has happened in the past. Babylon, in order to justify the claim as an ancient empire state, elevated the worship of a local deity named Marduk, uh, and they used a whole uh, myth called Enuma Elish to promote the sovereignty of Babylon through the religious, uh, to the religious power that was exercised by the main deity of Babylon named Marduk. So they're thinking, okay, well, that's the same thing that the Israelites did. They created this God Yahweh, these fictional characters like David and Solomon, and that's how it came to be. And the archaeological record does not really support the idea that there was a King David. So he is considered to be a fictional king, just like Arthur. Uh, Israel did not see as a kingdom until the 7th century. And there is no some evidence outside the Hebrew writings. And as I said, guys, observed in 1994, two scholars uh, actually declared the historical death of King David. In other words, they had enough evidence to say that no, King David was not a real person, a real historical figure. He was just probably some kind of trial chief leader that was elevated fictitionally to the role of a king. So, well, let's, let's examine uh, the evidence. Okay, let's, let's look at what is out there really and see if we can actually justify the existence of a king, David, uh, with archaeology. So, one of the most important monuments that, have, that was discovered in the city of Divan, this is the capital of the Moabites, is what is called the Mesha inscription or also the Moabite stone. Now, Andre Lumier, he, saw, he did a study on these stones and the, the whole history of how this monument was discovered. It's very interesting, but we don't have time to do it uh, today. So, it was discovered in 1868. Uh, the is about 20 meters uh, east of the Dead Sea. And in the stella, 
the famous King Mesha, you know him from because he appears in the book of Chronicles, uh, makes tribute to his god Chemosh uh, about all the military campaigns, the military victories that he had. Now, in lines uh, 39, uh, lines uh, 31 and 32, contains a very interesting story. You can see the biblical side of this story in 2 Kings 3.5. Now, the scripture dates to the 8th century. Uh, and just to give you kind of an example, you know, when you see the inscription, you see these signs, okay? Uh, so, this is kind of a doubt, okay? Uh, and this is what D, V, and then, uh, and then the E, okay? So, uh, then we have the words also, these uh, two letters, okay, that you want to pay attention. Uh, this is more my script, so I'm just going to give you an idea of uh, what you want to be looking for. Then they read the inscription, okay, and they found uh, these two important, these three letters, okay. So, Bey uh, Atav, so it means Bey, uh, the, the word Bey means house, okay, and, and it was used in a lot of ancient documents to um, not necessarily signify a physical house, but more an ancestry. So, for instance, Mike's uh, uh, kids are from the house of Mike Stevenson. Does it mean that they are, it means that they're family, okay? Or well, they are the descendants. And also you have the word Alex, okay? And this one that we transfer as a W. So what well, they were basically just a dialect here to make sure that you actually read the Jim David of House of David. Um, now, uh, the mayor is a French professor, uh, and he conducted a study on the squeeze of this monument, and also the, for the most recover from the monument, because it was destroyed by the locals, thinking that the monument actually had gold inside. Now, when, when he did this, this study, uh, in 931, appears a very important aspect, as I'll show you, you can see it here, uh, highlighted, okay? Begin David in the house of David. So here's a foreign king, Mesha, who uh, identifies that one of the territories that he conquered was ruled, and he makes us hungry specifically, was ruled by somebody who was of the house of David. Now, some people have argued against this reading because, again, you have few letters missing, and they say it's not complete, but recent three-dimensional studies have, that have been done on the stone with the fragments left actually corroborate the reading of Beyid David in the inscription. So, it has been actually confirmed that it does mention um, David as a king. So he had you in line 31 that it was uh, similar uh, to another inscription that I mentioned this morning and which I'm going to be talking about at this moment, okay? So, the mention still that before the tail dam was discovered, people did not think about these letters as identifying uh, David as a king and a royal ancestry related to it. But after they discovered the Tildan Stella that dates to the 9th century, so notice, the Moabite stone dates to the 8th century, the Tildan dates to the 9th century, then they discovered the similarity in the reads. I'm going to skip this one. So we can go to the Tildan. Now, Tildan is on the north side of Israel. As I said, it was pretty much the entryway of people traveling from Mesopotamia into the Levant. So if you can think about uh, Mesopotamia in this area, the Arabian desert in the center, and then Israel, Palestine in this area, and the Mediterranean Sea in this area. People could not cross the desert because that would be, you know, it would be suicide. The only person, there was two, two people who did it, one of them never the desert, okay? Uh, so they would travel north, following the path of the rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris, uh, they turned towards the 
west on the very north the Anatolia Syria that area and then travel south and enter through precisely this important city or cross this important city uh, named the city of Dan. Now in 1994 most scholars were ready to pronounce again the death of historical David and Solomon. However in 1993 uh, a monument or stella in secondary use. What does it mean secondary use? It means that uh, the monument itself was destroyed and the stones were being used in a pavement to, to create a floor uh, or, or wall so they can actually not serve there. So the, the monument lost validity or importance so they destroyed and used the stone as a secondary material. Uh, it was written on basalt, uh, it was used on, this, on the, the paved piazza, on the plaza, and uh, Dr. Abraham Grant and Gila Kuba were the ones who discovered this. Now this is very interesting because I said before, in the nation's poem, they couldn't really read those letters because there was nothing to compare with. But once they found the total inscription with a similar type of script, then they were able to compare and then add the missing letters. You can see on the screen, we have here Beit David, House of David. So in Land A, this is important also, in Land A you have the terms uh, Melech Yishmael, King of Israel, and then the following line, House of David. Mentions both Southern and Northern Kingdom in Northern Ireland. He has a good parallel because this was written by the king of Damascus. You have a root, uh, a good parallel of the story of, of the content of the inscription in 1st Kings chapter 15. He also mentions uh, Asa of Judah, Ben Hadam of Aram, Basha of Israel. So he was, this is a well documented document. And it dates to the 9th century uh, BC, that means before Christ. And the, the pottery release, the stella actually confirmed that reading as well. So it means that the stella itself was written a little bit before that. Uh, now King David and Solomon uh, reigned to the, well, the kingdom dates to the 10th century. This is just like a hundred years difference between when David was alive and when the inscription was, the inscription was actually written. This is another close-up of the inscription Beyi David. Okay? Now, there's some claims. Okay, uh, as I said uh, last night, uh, all the areas is the subject to perspective. Okay, people, you know, they, when, when you discover something that supports the text, then people come up with alternative interpretation of what you have been discovered. So we can all agree that that's a chair, right? But we can disagree what that chair is for. It can be for the pastor to see, it can be just at the doorway, it can be just uh, for somebody to rest their feet. It can be just uh, just a historical or a kind of uh, monument, remember somebody if you put the name here or somebody else in the back. You know, how is used with subject to interpretation? We all agree as a chair. Well, people came up with alternative interpretation of this you know. So for instance, Davis, one of the mutualist scholars, argued that there is no dividers and the word David can be translated as not book here or below. They are not going to say, no, it's forgery. That's so, somebody did it's false. Then another one blanket said that the mysterious blood, he just said that's a beloved of Yahweh as an idea of the sanctuary. And then George Athos indicated that it was actually another way of referring to Jerusalem, to Ir, uh, that's using the name in Hebrew Ir, which means city, city of Jerusalem. All those we thought this way alternative interpretation of trying to avoid the fact that now you have an inscription written by an enemy of Israel that verifies that there was a king of Israel named David and his descendant was now the king that was the enemy of this other person from Damascus. So people get very creative when they try to undermine the evidence outside of the biblical text. So, uh, well, here's some counter arguments. For instance, 
for the word Bethlehem, there's no uh, word dividers that we have. You know, uncle, kiddo, beloved, makes no sense. I mean, when you put these words into translation in the rest of the text, it makes like kid of Israel, beloved uncle. It, may, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit the context. Uh, the term uh, is not a key equivalent to here of David, the city of David, and there's no proof whatsoever in any other document that uses the term Beit David to equate Jerusalem. There's just no, it's just in the imagination of people. And the term, this is very interesting, their term is equivalent to extra biblical uh, text that mention only as king and uses the same terminology. Begit only, house of only. So scholars say, oh yeah, that's a reference to the ancestry of Andre, to the royal of Andre. But when you find Begit David, oh no, no, that's not a reference to the kingdom of David. So they're not consistent in the claims that they make. So, so what, what do we have uh, with these two uh, inscriptions? First, the quality of the evidence fits with what has been standard to accept as a history of other models such as Ori, Ahab, Gehu. The quantity of evidence lags behind is true. We, don't have, we have only two inscriptions. However, textual evidence, because of the destruction of the inscription, is also challenging to be able to interpret. Nevertheless, there is a strong possibility, and I say possibility for, for the lack of a better word, uh, there, is, there, there is, from an archaeological perspective, there is almost a certainty that these inscriptions do talk about the king, the king of Israel who was named David. Both written by enemies of Israel, so they were not political propaganda in favor of Israel. Both used the same terms that have been used and that have been standard, even in Mesopotamian documents, to um, mention a royal dynasty. So again, you have the house of Omri, the house of Ahab. Uh, yet, in the, in the obelisk is mentioned as descendant of the house of Omri, even though Yehu actually comes and kills uh, all the descendants here. And he actually he took uh, the kingdom uh, by power. So it is a standard, it is consistent, so there's no way we can argue that this actually is political propaganda. And then third, the spelling on both documents, the Moabite stone and the Teldan inscription is very consistent, it's the same. But what about an organized kingdom? Do we have evidence of the existence of a kingdom during the 10th and 9th century before Christ. So let's look at some of the some of the some of the archaeological uh, evidence that have been there. Now, in uh, First King 9:15, it reads as follows. Now, this is the account of the forced labor which King Solomon divided to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the middle. The one of Jerusalem, and what else? Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. So, kings, in the book of Kings, it is recorded that Solomon conducted some kind of reconstruction of these sites. If that is the case, you should be able to find at least some kind of standardized process or architectural remains that might be consistent in dating and in form. Uh, sure enough. So, uh, Bill Deaver, actually, uh, an Israeli archaeologist, uh, Yadin, was the first one to discover a, sp a specific type of gate that was used during uh, a reconstruction dated precisely to the 9th and 10th century. Okay? Uh, he called it the three gates, uh, gates of the entrance to the city. They consisted of a main pathway into the city with its small spaces, one, two, three, one, two, three on each side. There's no uh, study that I know of that uh, 
shows why they built this case this way, but most likely you have to go with some kind of protective uh, measure of the city. So if you have enemies enter into the city, it will be more difficult because you can counter them into these spaces and eliminate them right there. But again, that's that's not uh, that's my my guess of why they were built this way. However, what is important for this point is that the same type of gate dating to the same time was found in the city of Gezer. You can see it right there, it's the same, the same type of gate. And this one was excavated partially by uh, Dr. William Deaver. Now, Dr. Deaver, uh, he's, he's been very uh, kind to advanced archaeology. Uh, Dr. Hassel, Michael Hassel, the person from Southern, and Dr. Younger study under Dr. Deaver, and I believe also the William Deaver had, uh, he worked also together with Siegfried Horn in some of the excavations, so they, he knew them personally, and he has a good relationship with the Adventist world of archaeology. Now, before this, uh, William Deaver did not agree or accept the, the historical validity of David, but after this gay system was discovered, then he changed his mind. And this is somebody who is very, very skeptical. He's not a, he's an agnostic Jew. He's a very secular scholar. Uh, no, he's, he's made the most uh, outrageous claims for Christians when it comes to the biblical text, okay? However, uh, he, now he changed his mind about the existence of David Salom after the discovery of this game, and also they were discovered not only in Hazard, in Gezer, but also in Megiddo as well. Just like the biblical text says, all these games, even though some scholars like Israel Finkelstein have tried to say no, they don't take the same time, and he tries to use a different chronology to be able to place this gate, several studies have confirmed the fact that these games were built during a time in which, according to the biblical record, there was a united kingdom led by David and then succeeded by Saul. So we're talking about the 10th and 9th century before Christian era. But, you know, uh, Adventist archaeologists have not stayed actually behind on this, on this debate. There were recent excavations in a site named Kirbe Kayafa. Now, most of you guys are acquainted with the Valley of Elam, right? What story happened in the valley? What famous battle? Goliath and David. Okay? So, uh, so you, this is a picture of the Valley of Elam, and you can see some of the sites here. For instance, Sukkot will be number one, it's here. Uh, and Aseka is numbered a three of the way up here. So the battle happens sometime somewhere along this area. Okay? Now the sign that I want you to pay close attention to is this one. Kirbet Hayafi. The word Kirbet in Arabic means ruins. Okay? And Kayafa is just the name of a local area. So the ruins of Kayafa. Now there's two there's two types of ruin in archaeology. A people either expanded their cities or their places of living uh, vertically or horizontally. So what happens when some, you, you have your house or you have your city gets destroyed, then you build on top of the ruins. You build new walls, new roof, that gets destroyed, then you build again and again. And that creates what is called in Arabic a tall or a mound. So I have a Tel Jalul means the mound of the village of Jalul. However, in other areas, it was more it was more uh, reasonable to instead of expanding up, you expand to the side. So you use this building it gets destroyed, so you build next to it, and that's what is called a kirbet, a ruin that expands horizontally instead of vertically. Okay. So this is kirbet Kayala. Now the of this side is why his his location, okay? Again, it is in the valley of Isa. This is a map where you can see Tel Safi or the Philistine city of Gath. You see the city of Aseka, Sukkov, and then you see Karbe Kayafa on the other side of the valley. Now, let me read you the description of the excavator of Kirbe Kayafa, Joseph Garfinkel. 
Kibakayam is about two or three hectare site located in the Cephala region of Israel. During seven excavation seasons, the, from the 7th to the 13th, 2013, 20% of the site was uncovered and a large fortified city dated to the Iron Age 2A was on Earth. The random metric dating of this city uh, went to the early 10th century before Christian era and is based upon 27 examples. As the city was destroyed suddenly, very rich assemblages of finds in various categories were retrieved. The data and the new data completely changed our understanding of the 10th century BCE before Christian era, before a common era in the Cephala a poorly known area prior to the Kirbe Kayafa excavations. The results of the excavation bear out the biblical tradition related to state formation process in Judah as early as 1000 before the Christian era, the time of King David. Since 1880, various scholars have attempted to create an alternative understanding of the birth of the Judean kingdom claiming that it was founded only at the end of the 8th century BC, 300 years after David, or at the end of the 9th century BC, 200 years after David. The new result from Kirbe Kayafa, a fortified city in Judah from the time of King David, severely challenged these approaches. It is for no surprise in the various aspects of the site and its interpretation are both Debated. Now, this is from the excavator. The excavation happened between the University of Jerusalem along with Southern Adventist University. So we were involved precisely in this equipment. I wasn't involved. Uh, Dr. Hassel with his team was involved in these excavations. So here's, here's the words from, from the excavator. He corroborates several things. One, there was a fortified city dated to the 10th century BC, right at the time of David, located precisely in the valley of Elah, which is the center of one of the most uh, transcendent episodes in the Bible, which is the battle between David and Goliath. But there is more to it. So, in uh, 1 Samuel 17, 51 to 53, we read as follows. David ran and stood over him, he took hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from the from the sheath. Okay, this is talking about taking Goliath's sword. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistine saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistine to the entrance of Gath. You already saw where Gath is located, okay? Until Saturday. And to the gates of a crown, their dead were strewn along, the Sharayim rode to Gath and Ekron when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistine, they plundered the now, the word Sharayim, or the word Shahar in Hebrew, means entrance or gate. But you have the plural suffix added to the word. Just like in Spanish, we add an S. You know, we, don't, we say the plate or los platos. Or in English, we also add S with some words. We say the chair or chairs. So in Hebrew, the plural, I mean, the plural suffix can mean two things. Either a lot of things, a lot of gates, or a dual gate. So there's not a single word in Hebrew to imply dual, so you use the plural. So what he's saying here is that uh, this, uh, in this battle, the, the people that the Israelites killed, the bodies were laid across from the Shalayim, or the city of two gates. Now, most cities, we only have one gate, and the reason is protection. When there is uh, an army coming to invade you, you want to limit any possible access point that they may have. 
So they will build one gate, secure the well, and the rest is just huge uh, rock made uh, walls. Okay, very thick, so they will prevent from anybody actually coming into the city. However, this one has a particular interest that it has, apparently it has two gates. Uh, again, there are other mentions in Joshua and also in Chronicles, the same idea. So in the excavations of Kiev Kayafa, right in the valley of Ila, they found one gate, and you can see here in the same single construction, this part here is a road, it's a section of way. We have one, two, three. One, two, three. Just like the ones that you found in Gezer, Hazar, and Megiddo. But on top of that, the pottery of the site dates also to the 10th century BCE, okay, before Christian era. Now, examinations <coughs> continue, and they also found a second gate. And this is kind of an aerial site of, of, of a very pretty the site. You can see the whole site here. You can see the gates uh, of this area. Here's one. Okay. Here's the gate, and then the other one is somewhere along here this way, or this area here. I'll show you a picture. So they found another gate, and guess the what? It had the same basic architecture laid out as the gates found in Megiddo, Gezer, and Hazor. And here's a city, a Sharayim, that has precisely two gates built in the same pattern that you see in these other cities. Here's a plain uh, print of a the site, and you can see how this one gate on the, on the south area here, and the one gate on the northern area, uh, sorry, on the western area as well. So you have those two sites, and those two gates, in a city that dates to the 9th century. Now, interesting enough, the pottery inside the city, they found something that's called Astor Ware, which is being associated with the Philistines. They also found uh, a lot of uh, war weapons that were associated. So this was some kind of military post. And in addition to that, they found Hebrew, well, Hebrew or local uh, Moabite inscriptions. This one is, looks like a kind of like a calligraphy uh, type of inscription, so they were just practicing how to write it, but the, the biographical study showed that this actually dates also to the 10th century, and they found, in addition to that, they found a very important inscription with, uh, in a jar, in a storage jar, that reads the following reading. Please remember uh, this name, Ishmael, son of Beda. Have you actually heard this name Ishbaal or Ishbaal? When did you recall it? Me with the scholars, come on. Didn't he say, didn't he challenge David? Yes, and who, who, who was this who actually did this to David? The song of Saul. Okay. Now, when they did again the panographic analysis, they this inscription to precisely the 10th and the 9th century. Uh, it coronates with all the surrounding fibers. And note something that one of songs of Saul is named sometimes Ishboset or sometimes Ishbaal or Ishbaal. Now, this is Ishbaal, son of Beda. This is not the song of Saul. But it shows that the name was actually common during the 10th century, and there was somebody in this city who had a similar name to one of uh, uh, King Saul's sons, Ishmael. Now, in addition to that, they found also that several uh, shrines. Okay, shrines are like a small objects that have their like, culture. You put the deity. The figure of the deity inside, okay, and it will be used in house or temples to kind of resemble uh, the deity themselves, the temple of the gods. Okay. Now, what is interesting 
is that, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and read, a, read up the paragraph later, which are the words of the excavators. The unique stone model shrine from Cuba Kayafa contributes new data to royal architecture in Judah in the first half of the 10th century. The triplet motif and the recessed gold frame on its facade show that aspects typical of royal architecture in the Iron Age Levant, previously known archaeological from the 9th to the 10th century, developed 150 years earlier than previously thought. In other words, because of all this, this architecture was later, that was identified with the Israelite kingdom, but after they discovered this particular shrine, they realized, no, this type of architecture dates earlier because this shrine will be built based upon the bigger model of temples that you have. So it's like, you know, when you build Legos, and you have Legos of a, uh, one of the World Trade Towers, or so those huge buildings, you build those Legos based upon the models, the bigger models that you see. Same thing here with the, with the shrines. They will build these shrines emulating or imitating the architectural features that were already in place in the temples. But in addition to that, okay, in recent study of this artifact, it was uh, it was shown. Uh, this is no frame in the biblical description of King Solomon's palace and the temple in Jerusalem. In other words, the shrine was most likely built resembling the building of the most holy place in the temple of Jerusalem. The modern cover in Kirbekayaf shows that an elaborate Iron Age architectural style had already developed by the 10th century. Such construction is typical of royal enterprise, suggesting precisely that the state, for, the state formation, the establishment of a social elite, and urbanism existed in the region during the days of King David. So again, you have the gates that were standardized, and I have a imitation of a temple in miniature that is built, okay, in, uh, according to what was already existent there as a main cultic center. So if you want to know about approximately how the Holy of Holies looked like, there it is. But no, I'm not doing cultural. No, but you're doing cultural. Yes, I'm doing cultural. Yes. Just, just wanted you to know that it's this, this point about cultic objects is the point, is the, is the actual point of uh, Doctor's uh, dissertation. So he, when he is digging, he is looking specifically for cultic objects like this. And, and I'll talk about this a little bit, but just let me just also throw this little. Uh, extra information. All the city of Gath tells something. So you saw the map, you saw where Gath was, okay, in the Valley of Elah. Uh, they found an inscription that actually mentions the name Goliath. So this is a, most, most scholars agree that this is not necessarily Goliath of the biblical record. Nevertheless, it shows that the name was common among Philistines. So whoever wrote the account between David and Goliath, he was not creating necessarily a fictitious character. He was using a name that they all knew was common among the Philistines. So there you have Kirta Kayafa, you have a, a description that names one of Saul, I mean, uses the name that was also used for one of Saul's uh, sons, Ishbosheth or Ishmael. And now in Gath, you have an inscription that mentions the name Goliath, just like the biblical story. But you know why also they know that this, is, this was a giant uh, city? Because one of the things that we look for uh, to kind of know what people were eating are bones, you know? You eat your chicken and you know, these, these, are, these are dirt floors, it's a not nice car with trash cans, so you just boom, throw them over the floor. And that's wonderful, because then, like 3,000 years later, we get to dig into people's trash. 
And when we take it to people's trash, we found the delicious balls that they left. Now, in the entire city of Kirbe Kayafa, the, the, the most common type of ball that you find is sheep and goat. Everybody has sheep and goat. You, you don't want to be a sheep and goat in beautiful times. Okay? Because you can eat it. <laughs> but, uh, but what is interesting though is that pig balls are also very frequent in, in a lot of the sites. However, in Kirka Kayafa, there was only one small area that had few pig balls. In other words, somebody was not following the Levitical law in the Judean Judea city and was in their pigs, you know, uh, hidden somewhere. But the friends, there's no pig bones. So it means they were not eating pig bones. And then, from a cultic perspective, and this is something that uh, Joseph uh, Garfinkel also included, is that the cultic repertoire that is typical from Philistine side, you know, small female figurine with highlighted breasts or tunic parts, so it was not there. Only, the only thing you found was shrines that were not, they didn't have any zoomorphic figures, and only one small figure in the middle, they don't know if it's uh, anthropomorphic or zoomorphic. But the typical cultic repertoire that you find in other sites was absent from Kirbe Kayafa, just as is also absent so far from the site of Shiloh that we discussed last night. So it means that there's hardly any doubt Hardly any doubt that this is a Judah city, a city of Judah that was used most likely as a military camp or fort in the fight against the Philistines. So, don't we have, was David a historical figure or not? So let's let's kind of revisit what we talked about. First, you have a description from that, from Syria, it was, it was written by the king of Syria, naming, uh, the, the, sorry, having the terms, Melech Israel, Beyig David, king of Israel, how, from the house of David. So he then defines a one of, uh, somebody from the royal, in this case Omri, belonging to an ancestry, a royal ancestry that starts or has as his main founder, David. Then out of that inscription, out of that spelling, then they analyzed the Moabite stone, which was written by King Mesha, well, not by him himself, but he was under his command was written, that also have a similar use of similar spelling. Be'yid David, Be'lech Yishra'el. So you have now then two inscriptions written by the enemy of Israel that do corroborate the existence of a king associated with Israel then David. Then you have the architectural evidence. So you have the three gates, or the six gates, sorry, uh, system entrance, eight cities that according to the biblical text were reconstructed or remodified during the reign of Solomon. So you have any Gezer, you have any Megiddo, and you have any Hazor. But in addition to that, then you have a 10th century city that has, that is was Judai in the Valley of Elam, that no doubt have a different cultural materials than the ones that you find in Canaanite sites or the ones that you find in Philistine sites. And on top of that, he curls with the story having two gates built after the same pattern that we have seen in the other cities, and in this one case, has two gates just like the biblical text mentions it. So, was David a historical figure or not? That's for you to decide. Mm -hmm. It depends how you want to see the evidence. So, you have an architecture standard project, you have a Kira Kayafa. But at the end, you know, I'm going to put the second clip from a critical scholar. This is not a conservative scholar. 
Okay? This lady decided to interview David Shiskin, who excavated at the city of Hazard. Uh, he is not a Bible believer, he's not a conservative scholar at all. But this is what he had to say or to respond to this lady when he was interviewed by her about the validity of King David. So let me run this very quick. So that can tell you a little bit about where he comes from ideologically. Yet, yet, he has to deal with the fact that there is extra biblical evidence that does support the existence of a ruler named David. So what he does with the text? He picks and chooses what is true and what is not. However, he himself has to admit that yes, there is a historical character named David. Now, what you accept from the biblical text as factual value or not is your decision. But the evidence is there. So yes, David did exist. Thank you. Thank you.